if you will, turn in your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning in verse 21, as we continue our study through the Word. So we watch in Jesus' ministry as now his popularity has just absolutely exploded. But with that popularity is also the hostility from the religious leaders. And you'll remember that the Pharisees and the Herodians, they, they decided to partner together to destroy Jesus. And, and now, since the purpose is to destroy Jesus, Jesus now has offered the kingdom, and the kingdom has been rejected by the nation. And so Jesus will continue to offer the kingdom, but it's going to now be on an individual basis. He is going to focus himself on the 12 apostles and the developing and building up of them. And we saw how he prayed and selected those 12. And, and then we also saw now how Jesus began to teach in a different way. In the last chapter, we see here that he begins to teach in parables, or last time we saw the parable. And we saw that it was the first of these parables, and it was the parable of the sower. And you will remember that we pulled that apart. And one of the things that was so interesting when we looked at it was that the Word of God expositional constancy, it unlocks the other parables. And so we started to define our terms, and the seed is the Word of God, and birds are evil. And, uh, and thus forth. But one of the things that we noticed is that the seed is the word of God. And the word of God is perfect, amen? In the parable, there wasn't good seed and then bad seed and then mediocre seed and then good seed again. It was always perfect seed that was uh, laid forth. But out of the four conditions of the heart, out of the four soils, there was only one in four that produced any harvest whatsoever. We saw the hard heart that produced no fruit whatsoever. We saw the emotional heart, the one that is quick to jump on but quick to jump back off again and couldn't put its roots down. We saw the divided heart. That's the heart that can't quite keep its priorities in place. And so there was no fruit in that person's life. And then ultimately there was the good soil. And that good soil produced an incredible harvest, 30, 60, 100 times. And, and so Jesus gives that parable. And, and what it really confronts us with is the importance of the condition of our heart. At Calvary Chapel, we believe that it's the word of God sown into the heart, empowered by the Holy Spirit that changes people's uh, lives. And that is what we believe and we see it all the time. But that word can only go into the good hearts. And so the condition of our heart is the limiting factor that there is a piece and a part. It's not just exposure to the word of God. It's not just coming and listening to the word of God. Listen to this. It's not even just sitting there and reading the word of God and doing devotions. We talked about who had the hardest hearts in Jesus' day. They were the ones that were the, the, the deepest studiers of the Word of God. They did more devotions, more scripture memory, and yet in their close proximity to the Word of God, there was absolutely zero penetration of the truth of God's Word into their heart. And that, that really needs to just make us stop and to say if it was the, the people that were reading the Word of God that were not fruitful in their life. And, and we see it. We see the conduct of the Pharisees. We see how judgmental they are. We see how critical they are. We see how unloving they are. We see the hypocrisy, the outward show. We see the love of the flesh and power that they had and the prestige and, and the renown. They loved the best seats at all of the feasts and they were filled with, with pride. And so there is a, a, a real evaluation that Every single one of us, myself included, needs to make, and the question is this, is your life being radically transformed? I mean, I mean radically transformed. Are you seeing the fruitfulness in your life? Are you seeing yourself changing? Are the people around you seeing you change as you encounter the word of God in the good soil of your heart? And if it's not, then we want to take a deeper look at that because I think that we all want to be fruitful, Amen. Don't we all want, not 30, 60, don't we all want 100, 100 fold fruitfulness? Because what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. So let's remember why we're put on the face of the earth to love God and to be loved by Him. 
to exchange that love and then to love others. Jesus reduced it down to that simple, and that, that should be the focus of our life. And that happens when our identity is in Christ. And so our identity has an awful lot to do with the condition of our heart. Whether your identity is in Christ or whether your identity is in anything else that the world tells you your identity should be in. If your identity is in your job, if your identity is the fact that you're a, a mother, your identity is a wife, or your identity is a father, all of those things are wonderful things. But that's not what your identity is supposed to be. And you see, what happens so oftentimes for believers is we step into the kingdom, we get saved, and then we don't put our identity in Christ. We keep our identity in what our identity was prior to coming to Christ. And now you know what changes? The focus of our prayer. Now we ask God to make us more successful. Now we ask God to help us to be a better wife. Now we ask God to make us better mom. So suddenly now where our identity isn't in Christ, our identity was in what we found purpose and fulfillment in, we start to ask God to, to increase our identity when he wants our identity to be in Christ. Amen? You following? And, and so here we see that this deeper soul work, this deeper examination of our identity and uh, in the work of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is going to be absolutely crucial to whether or not we're being changed. So let's understand once again that Jesus is, is setting up the kingdom of God. He's established the kingdom of God. And his presence, listen, is the kingdom of God. Amen? That where Jesus is, that's the kingdom of God that he is setting up. And where Jesus is in the kingdom of God is the reverse of the curse. Every single thing that sin took away and broke absolutely is defeated in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so wholeness, wholeness over illness. Peter, mother-in-law, just had a fever. Boom! In the presence of Jesus, the fever is gone. You know, we have the withered hand and, and physical impairment, boom. We have paralysis, boom. We have all the way to the death of Lazarus, and Jesus is just has authority over death itself. In the kingdom, in the presence of Jesus Christ, we have absolutely zero problems, amen? And that's the kingdom of God. And you know what? For three glorious years, listen, for three unbelievably glorious years, the kingdom of God was here, the king was here, and he was offering everybody to step into that kingdom. But then Jesus is going to depart, and it's going to be, you know, we're not getting the kingdom right now. The physical kingdom of the king ruling and reigning. In the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, we are going to see absolute authority over all of these things. And the earth is now going to run the way that it was supposed to from the very beginning. How glorious is that going to be? Is that exciting news, or is it just me? <laughs> but for three years, oh, you could come into the presence of Jesus. You could step into the kingdom. <laughs> and all authority has been given unto Jesus. And so we see that Jesus now begins to teach by parable. Parable is parallel learning. He's going to tell stories, and then you have to make the application to your life. Seeing that you might not see and hearing you might not hear, no longer is Jesus going to be investing himself. He's going to be teaching kingdom principles, but he's going to be doing it in parables. And, and so we saw last time the very first parable, Right now he's teaching kingdom parables. So he's trying to teach us what, those, what, what the kingdom of God looks like. Now, we're not going to have the physical kingdom. We're going to have the spiritual kingdom of God until it comes physically, and it's going to physically come at the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So he now is teaching, though, kingdom principles. And so these are the kingdom parables. Jesus is also going to become highly critical of the religious leaders, and he is going to use parables to just absolutely unveil them from all of the hypocrisy and, and the pretense and, and all that they had gotten so far away, listen, from the heart of God. So here we are going to see the second parable that Jesus gives, and so we're going to begin here in the 21st verse of this, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And, and also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? So in ancient Israel, lamp was this lighted wick that was in a clay bowl. When we were in Israel, we went through the tour, they picked up one of these. And this is exactly what the, the lamps looked like back then, just a little piece of pottery. There's a container right in the middle. You filled that up with oil, and then it had a wick, and you'd trim the wick and pull it out and light it. 
and then you'd carry it around, and this was how you light it. Now, on the walls, about two-thirds of the way up on the walls in, in, in virtually every single room, there would be a brick that would have been turned sideways so that it, it creates a little platform. So when you walked into the room, you set it right up there so that it would then cast the light into the room. When you went into another room, you picked it up and took it with you, and you went in and set it on the lampstand, that little brick that was in the wall that was the construction of that day. And so this was the, the lampstand. So Jesus says, talking about light, what do you do with light? Now remember that light is a typology of truth. And so truth what happens to truth? Well, truth is the word of God again. Pure, perfect truth. Every word that comes out of the mouth. And so we had just learned from that first parable that there is a necessity to respond to, to light in your life. And, and that you are going to either shut yourself off to the truth as it is revealed to you or you are going to be receptive to that light. And so light is awareness. And so the Holy Spirit is going to bring us into awareness of our own hearts. Now, the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked among all things who can know it. So when we try and look at our hearts and when we start to present it before the Lord, we need revelation from God because we are so good at deceiving ourselves into thinking that, of course, my heart is good. I've got really good soil in here. And, and then we just move uh, on. And, and we see that the light comes in, and then it goes right back out again. He says that we're supposed to not only live in the light, but also we're supposed to let our light shine means that as we live in the light, that light is going to move out of our lives. It's going to move out in our relationships with our kids and our spouses and the people that are uh, around us. We, we're going to breathe and, and naturally talk about God and the things of God because that that is who we are. See, our identity is in Christ. It's the most important thing. It's the most exciting thing because, listen, God is changing you, and God's changing me, and he is molding you into this, the, the, the DNA of Jesus Christ. And as he does that, listen, the, your life gets so much better, infinitely better. So absolute principle of the kingdom of God is, is that the spiritual life far supersedes the carnal life. And so when you start to step into that spiritual life, you start to experience the incredible love and grace and mercy, and God keeps drawing you deeper and deeper and deeper. You become more fruitful, more fruitful. You want to enter deeper into the kingdom of God. Now, when you get saved, all you did is you just stepped into the kingdom. Now you're saved. Now the question is, how deep do you want to go with God? Do you want to stay at the door? God will let you. He'll let you stay there. You want to go ankle deep with him? He'll go ankle deep with you. You want to go knee deep with him? He'll walk you out to knee deep. You want to go up to your chest? That's when it starts getting dicey, doesn't it? You know, when you start to feel the waters like, you know, right on your, your chest now. And he'll walk with you. But guess what? He wants you to swim over your head out into the river of living water that just washes over and fills your whole life. And so that's... That's the invitation that, uh, that Jesus is giving. But we have to change our parameter. We have to change our filter. It's all about light now. It's all about truth and responding to and truth and creating that awareness. He says the, the, the lamp, the light, it, it, it's not meant to just you know, be stifled. It's not that you just read it and go, oh, that's truth, and, and you put it away. But it's to be set on a, on a lampstand. He says, for there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. And so we see that this is the, the time of illumination is referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, uh, let him hear. And so... If you're living in the world around you, if the interest of the world around you is the, is the same as your interest, if the things that you talk about at work are the same things that everybody in the world talks about, if, if your life is not being lived any differently than the people that are around you, then listen, you're not responding. Your light is going underneath a basket. And so Jesus says, walk 
in the light. Walk in the illumination. Allow the work to keep on going and keep on changing. Then he said, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Take heed to what you hear. In other words, pay attention. That's another, pay attention. Jesus is saying, this is, this is important. Pay attention to what I'm about to say here. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. And so, the same measure, using and receiving, are correlated to each other here. And to you who hear, more will be given. So, once again, when you read the scripture, <laughs> are you applying it to yourself? Or listen to this. A lot of people are really good at that, applying it to other people. <laughs> and you're like, oh, you know who needs this verse? I'm going to text them that right now. This is a good one. You know, and we start, we start using the word of God to examine everybody else's heart except whose? Mm, ours. Are we applying it? Are we letting the Holy Spirit soak? If you'll do that, then you know what? More truth is going to be given to you. If, you. if you hear the word of God and then let the word of God press it into your life, more truth is being revealed to you. And you're changed, listen, by the truth that you receive. Tr truth is the activation of the change that is going to be in your life. So it's so important how you're handling this mm, truth. And so uh, here Jesus is once again giving us what? He's giving us kingdom principles so that you know we have to make sure, listen, that we're not doing our devotions in order to check it off on the box. That it's not a part of the routine. That, yes, you know, I read the Word of God. Yes, I went to church this weekend. Yes, you know, and these, and these check boxes. You know what God wants? He wants an encounter with you. That, that's what He wants. And, and so, if you will come and open up your Bible, expecting to encounter God, and you open the Word of God, and you say, God, I'm desperate for you to talk to me. I don't just want, you know, stories about the kingdom. I want to experience the kingdom in my life. These, these are for me. They're not about uh, others. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and what? And forever. And so he, he is changing people all around us for those that are pressing in. Are you pressing in? Not just the, the routine. So many people, so many well-taught people, they get saved, they go to church, and they keep coming to church and they keep their going to heaven card stamped every week. But they're not changed at all. They're just as angry as they've ever been. They're just as frustrated as they've ever been. They're just as mean as they've ever been. Their marriages aren't any better. There's no change in their life. But you know what? They, they're marking off the box. They're reading the scriptures. They're, they're going to church. But they're missing. What are they missing? They're not allowing the transformational power of God to change them. And so this is what Jesus is, is talking about, you know, in our lives here. He goes on in verse 25 now, for whoever has to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Back to the parable of the sower. Remember, the seed falls on that heart. It's given, but guess what? It's not activated, so it's taken away. But the seed that goes into good soil, what happens? hundredfold. And so you know what? Deeper and deeper and deeper you go. God keeps on drawing you deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and who is determining all of this? You are. You see, you're a free moral agent. So you're going to decide how much of the kingdom you're going to live or how much you want to live in your own kingdom and ask God to help you build your kingdom. I did that. I was newly saved. I thought this is fantastic. Every problem I had. Jesus, help me close this sale. Jesus, let me have the biggest week ever. Lord, may my commissions be that. I mean, what, you have not because of you? I'm asking, okay, but what am I asking? You know, I'm asking for my kingdom to be built, and I'm wanting God to make me successful so that I can feel good about myself because my identity was stuck in the world. Instead of God, mold me into a man of God. Change me from the inside out. I want the abundant life. I want rivers flowing out of my heart. I want you to take me deep. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Whatever you have, if you're not using it, you know, there's that old saying, use it or 
lose it. And so I think that that's a physical, and this is also a spiritual application. If you if you are just resisting the 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 truth that you have, then you're not going to uh, to be in growing. The word of God, listen, needs the spirit of God. The truth, okay, is going to not be activated in your life. Verse 26, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter a seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. When the grain ripens immediately, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. If you ask a farmer, can you explain to me exactly how that seed germinates and grows? They're like... No. <laughs> but does it? Yes. And they don't need to understand uh, uh, how. It germinates and it grows. And, and it's because, listen, the DNA to whatever it is that is being grown is contained in that seed. The DNA for the entire corn plant and every single thing that it's going to need, every single bit of coating is contained inside of that seed. Now, how does that seed communicate and start to push out and build this whole plant? Nobody knows. The same is true in your own life. You see, when you receive the seed, the word of God, into your heart, guess what? The word of God is the DNA of Jesus Christ. It's the DNA. And that's what God is now going to form in you, the character now of Jesus Christ. And now the Holy Spirit is going to activate it and bring it to pass. Can you explain it? No. It happens a little bit here, a little bit there, however God is doing it. But what is the end? The end uh, is that the Word of God is everything that you need now to be able to be uh, fully integrated into Christ and as Christ is drawn uh, out of you. People can get hung up on the, the you know, I need to understand this. How does, how does this work? And Jesus' point is this. My ways are near your ways. God's ways are above your ways. Even the farmer, though, operates on this. Puts the seed in, and boom, it grows. Do you know what? Put the seed, put the word of God into you. Put it into good soil. Don't worry about how God is doing it. Know that he is doing it. And watch what happens in your life when you approach it that way. And so, verse 30. And then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? So again, Jesus is trying to explain the kingdom of God. And he says, or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest uh, under uh, its shape. Now, here we see that many commentators take and teach that this talks about the 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 church. This is a parable of the church. That the mustard seed is the early church and that it's planted and what happens is is that it grows and it grows up super big and it is super successful and it's absolutely glorious. And then Jesus Christ is going to return. It's called Kingdom Now Theology. And so everybody's going to become Christians. The whole world's going to be changed and, and then Christ is going to return. Standard interpretation of this parable. But Remember we talked about expositional constancy. That interpretation completely violates the hermeneutical laws of expositional constancy because uh, look at what we're talking about here. Number one, remember okay, that it says uh, here that all the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Now, birds, we found out, mean evil. And so this is not talking about this healthy church that is going to grow. It's talking about the imperfection of the church. The other thing here is that the, the, the grain, the mustard seed grows up, but a mustard seed is just an annual bush. It's small. And so for this to then grow up into this giant tree that has birds that are nesting in it, that's an unnatural growth. That is not a normal (laughs) growth. And so it's talking about that the church is not going to be pure, that the church is going to be corrupted. It is going to be polluted. It's going to grow bigger than it should be. There's going to be many non-believers that claim to be believers. You're going to see cults. You're going to see false teachings. You're going to see all sorts of other things. This is what they can. When you look at the history of the church since Jesus, it's there. 
There's many stretches where it does not have a very good, very good stretch run. And Jesus was saying that this, this is what is going to, uh, to happen. And even then, as he's sitting there, who's, who's he teaching to? Judas? He's one of the apostles right there that he is mm, teaching to. He's one of the birds that's going to lodge uh, uh, underneath. And, and so uh, here we see that, uh, that the tares and uh, the wheat are going to be uh, sown together, and God's going to figure it out uh, later on. And so... It goes on in verse 33, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to them. And so you remember that Jesus is revealing truth to them, but they're struggling with. So Jesus is sensitive to what you're able to hear. He, he knows how much light you, you can take and, and what you can't take. Every single time he started to talk about his death, they were like, oh, you know, why are you talking about this? You know, why? They couldn't even bear it. They couldn't even. And Jesus wanted to prepare them and equip them at the, at the last meal that he has, the last supper. He says, many things I wanted to talk to you, but you couldn't bear it. You couldn't bear it. You, you, you couldn't receive it. So God is always going to reveal truth at the level that you're able to receive it. And so Jesus here is, is teaching the, the truth. He then would explain it deeper to his disciples, but uh, once again, uh, only to the degree that they were able to receive it. So Jesus has had just one heck of a day. He is exhausted. You ever been exhausted? <laughs> you ever burnt it at both ends and you're borrowing against, you know, the, the, the future, but you just are pressed and you're just going, 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 and you know, you know, and then you just, you walk in the door and you just drop. It's just like you just collapse. You're just absolutely done. You're just gassed. Well, that's what happens to Jesus right here. He's fully God, but he's fully man. And the body that he has has physical limitations just like you and just like me. And Jesus has been ministering, he's been teaching, he's out in the boat. He continues to teach and teach and teach and teach and teach and share and preach and minister. And now, finally, it's towards the end of the day, and, and, and he's done. And he just kind of gives the command, <laughs> just sail over to the other side. And so they're over in Capernaum, and they're you know, out, out in the water. And so Jesus and the disciples in the boat are going to uh, head over. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long. It's about eight miles wide at its widest. But up on the northern end where they are, it's about five miles across. So it's just an easy sail. It's nice. It's evening time. They throw the sail up. They're just going to sail over to the other side. And Jesus goes to the back of the boat and just zonks. I mean, just out absolutely cold. I, I remember when we were raised, we had, you know, three boys within four years, and when, and when they were young, they, there were times that when Amber and I, you know, at the end of the day, <coughs> we would just, like, be laying on the couch, and I'd be like, you go get them. I'm like, no, you go get them, you know, and it's just that we're just, we're just done, you know, I mean, just, kids have so much energy, amen? <laughs> and so, you know, so Jesus is just at that point where he could sleep on concrete. In fact, he basically is. He goes to the bow, he goes to the, uh, to, to the stern, um, and there's a, a, a pillow there, a cushion, and he just lays down on this hard bench with a cushion, and he is out cold, and they're just going to sail over to the other side. And it says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with them. So Jesus had been teaching, and then other boats had come out and were around so they could hear better, and, and so you have this picture, huge crowds on the shore, and then Jesus just starts sailing to the other side, and so the other people decide they're going to sail with them, and so this little flotilla goes with Jesus and, you know, and the disciples, and they're just sailing across the northern top of the uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And it says in verse 37, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. 
So these storms on, on the Sea of Galilee, this is something that the Sea of Galilee is known for. It's a fairly small you know, body of water, but it is 635 feet below in sea level. And so what happens is that you have the cold air that will drop in, will rush in. Now you have Mount Hermon uh, that is right up at the end of the north. And so the cold off of that mountain will come dropping down. Then they also have these canyons that all come through there as well. So you have the thermals, so the, the, the air heats up the ground. And so you have the hot air that starts to rise. And then you have the cold air that's dropping into this and it becomes becomes turbulent uh, over there. Back a number of years ago, they had 15-foot waves. Can you imagine a lake with 15-foot waves that in Tiberias did damage to the hotels that were there and, uh, and everything else? We were out one time uh, sailing across the Sea of Galilee on our Israel tour, and it was just absolutely like Gilligan's Island. It was just you know nice and sunny and beautiful. We stopped and did worship, not a cloud in the sky. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the winds whipped up, and we had to all in the boat, we all moved to the back of the boat, and these things were like 10-foot waves that we were going up and splashing, and the water was just crashing over the boat. We got absolutely drenched, but we didn't care because we felt like it was a biblical experience, uh, you know, here. it's like, oh my gosh, we're living the Word of God, you know, uh, right now, so it was just, you know, kind of amazing, um, and, uh, and, and and so the, this is common because of the, uh, the geography of the area. But I want you to remember something. You have seasoned veteran fishermen on the boat. The, these guys have been fishing this all their lives. They've, they've been on the sea their whole life. They've seen the waves. They've navigated through the waves. They know exactly what to do when the waves come. But this one was a little tiny bit different. The fishermen were becoming fearful. The waves just weren't boisterous. They were filling the boat. And now it says that the, uh, the boat is getting up all the way to where it, it is going to be full. And when it gets full, then it's going down. And listen, everyone's going into the sea. And in that kind of a tempestuous storm, that's really bad news for survival. And I imagine that the the fishermen at first are like, well, this, this is getting a little choppy out here. And then it's like, these are getting pretty big, you know. And then it's like, this is starting to move into that category of top five, you know, that I've uh, seen in, in, in my life. And, and suddenly now it gets to the point where they're beyond their capacity to remain calm. Fear for their life is now starting to take over. And it says, and, but he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so they come to Jesus, and Jesus, this shows you how out cold Jesus is. <laughs> The boat's rocking up and down, and Jesus is just like a baby with a lullaby, you know, being rocked by, you know, by his mother there. He's not worried in the least bit. Why? Because he knows his father has him. He knows his father is watching him. There's nothing to be afraid of. And so he has perfect calm, perfect peace. Jesus is never stressed out. Jesus is never anxious. Jesus is just absolutely resting in his father's will. So they come and, <coughs> and they wake him up and, and they're panicking. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And we can understand this, this sentiment here. <coughs> Have you ever experienced that in your own life? In the trials that you're going through and it just feels like, oh, Lord, these are just, this is just, I don't know. And things start to compound in your life, whether it's illness or finances or, or, or what's going on in the life of your kids or your family or, 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 or the things that are happening in your life. And, you know, I'm okay for the beginning, and then it starts to press me a little bit more and starts to press me a little bit more. It presses me a little bit more, and then I get to my breaking point. And then I'm like, God, what is going on? But notice what he says. 
Don't you care? Jesus has only demonstrated that he cares about everybody. And so that fear, listen, we behave badly when fear pushes us. You will say things and do things and conduct yourself and make the worst decisions when you're gripped by fear. Here we see the disciples saying, don't you care about us? To Jesus. Because why? Because they're motivated by fear. And that's why Jesus has so much to teach us about fear and about anxiety and about being depressed and oppressed because he knows that, listen, we're spiritual beings, but we're also emotional beings. Those emotions start to get pushed around in our life and start to try and make us make decisions and take action and, and do things. When you're angry, your emotions will push you to make bad decisions, bad choices, bad use of words. Anybody ever had a bad choice of words because they were angry you know, uh, in their life? Wish they could just take that back. You know? I'll just rephrase it a different way, maybe. Because <laughs> you're angry. Your emotions push you into bad behavior. And so fear is another one of those emotions that will push you into bad behavior. So here we see that now what they're doing is they're putting wrong motive on Jesus. Don't you even care? Secondly, they don't assess the situation correctly. That we're perishing. Were they perishing? No. Because you see, you can't, you, you absolutely cannot perish in the presence of Jesus. Amen? You cannot perish in the presence of the one who created it all, who has all authority that has been given over to him. You can't. In his presence is the fullness of truth and life and light. And, and so they were in the presence of Jesus. So <coughs> they can't perish. So they put wrong motive on Jesus, number one. Don't you care? Number two, they assess the situation wrong. Why? Because they're afraid. And so in your life, in my life, when you start to have anxiety, when you start to have fear, you really need to start to govern your heart to here and get it into the, the presence of Jesus. Now, here's what they do right. They go to Jesus. Whenever you're feeling anxious, whenever you have anxiety, whenever you have fear, get into the presence of Jesus. They go and wake Jesus uh, up so that they now... Okay, can make their <coughs> appeal to them. That's absolutely spot on. That's the best thing that we can do. It says, and then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And so here we see just this incredible display of Jesus' power and authority. He can control the wind. I just want you to ponder that this next week. How do you do that? I, 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 I mean, the wind, like the molecules, and the, it, you know, and it's just this, and he's just stop, is what he says. Just stop. Silence you, and stop to the waves. Silence. You know how winds howl? Noise that the winds make? He says, stop. And the wind instantly stops. And he says to the, to the water, be still. I want you to know that the magnitude of this miracle, even if the wind stopped immediately, the waves would take a while to die down. But they don't. In a split second, it's flat calm. Glass, in the original language, is just absolute glass. All authority has been given unto Jesus. And so the, the disciples now, Jesus speaks to them, and he said to them, why are you so fearful? I love that. Because my question is this. Is that rhetorical? Jesus, do you really want us to answer that? Why are we fearful? Have you seen the level of the water? Did you see the size of the waves? Do you really want an explanation uh, on this? Uh, how is it that you have no faith? Why are you so fearful? Fear is that affection of the mind that arises when you sense danger. Then he asks him, why, 
Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And it says in verse 41, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey? I want you to notice something with me. When the waves are coming over the boat, it says they're fearful. Now look with me at the scripture. Once he calms everything down, now it says they were exceedingly fearful. They're more fearful after Jesus calms everything down, delivers them out of the storm. There's no danger whatsoever. Why is that? Why? Actually, in the original language, they're terrified. They're afraid, and they move to absolutely terrified. See, I believe they're terrified because of the manifestation of the power of Jesus. You see, if you're a person that likes to be in control, anybody like to be in control? <laughs> see, fear comes when things start to get out of control. And to the degree that it starts to get out of control is the degree that fear starts to rise uh, up in you. They're in this storm, and this storm starts to get out of control. And so their fear starts to rise uh, as the power of that storm continues to increase. And they have no ability to control it. When you can't control what's going on around you, you can create great anxiety. When Jesus, I would propose that when Jesus manifests his power over that wind and over that wave, he just made the power of that wind and wave look like nothing compared to the power of Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus is calling you into a relationship with him, you're going to have zero control. He's a hurricane force. And if you're a person that likes to control things, you're going to really struggle with that. That's going to be an area that God is really going to have to work with you on. Being in a relationship where you've got no control whatsoever is terrifying. And when they saw the power of Jesus displayed, they're like, who is this? Now, I want you to be reminded that this is before Jesus had said, I mean, that Peter has said, you are the Messiah, and, and all of that. There's still a lot of things that we haven't seen yet that are going to develop them. But here we see that, that now they, they move to exceedingly afraid. That surrender of your will to the life, not my will, but your will be done, that means that you're not going to have control anymore. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to surrender control? Or do you want it 50-50? I'll give you half of the, you know, give you half of the authority. Or I'll give you 99% and I get the veto power. <laughs> you know, just, or whatever you want, Lord, I'm in. Lead me and guide me. That is terrifying. And that's the relationship they're in when Jesus said, you follow me. And not only were they in that relationship, but Jesus has beckoned every single one of us into that relationship. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention back to that mustard seed. <laughs> that mustard seed. Mustard seeds are so small, really tiny. Somebody had given me a little bag of mustard seeds the other day, and I have them on my desk. Really, really small. And he says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, right, that you can cast this mountain, you know, and, and, and all. And so what incredible power we are talking about when he is saying that you can tell Mount Charleston to move or you can take Mount Charleston down. That's, that's power, a power that could move that mountain. That, that is incredible. Back in the 1860s, nitroglycerin was the most powerful substance that there was that, uh, that we knew how to handle. The problem with nitroglycerin, though, it was highly unstable. Uh, 
And, and if you bumped it, it would just go off and discharge. They, they were trying to be able to use it in construction and demolitions and all, but they were having tremendous accidents with it, and people were getting uh, really hurt um, with it. And, uh, and what happened was uh, that Albert Nobel, who was this Swedish chemist uh, engineer genius, guy born into a family of engineers ends up with 355 patents and he desires to try and to figure out how to be able to make nitroglycerin safer and so what he does is he learns that if you will take the the the, the liquid of nitroglycerin and you will put it into diatomaceous earth then that stabilizes it and then what it actually needs is a charge to set it off and so Alfred Nobel invents dynamite. And dynamite just, pardon the pun, explodes across the world. You know? I mean, everybody starts at using this tragic accident in the laboratory, and his younger brother dies in an explosion. Um, but they continue, they have all of these different um, patents. And, uh, and what happens is that in 1888, um, Alfred's brother Ludwig Nobel dies, and so this is you know years later, so you know, twenty years later, and Nobel has amassed this family has amassed an absolute fortune as they were able to harness. It becomes used in the military. They start using it to detonate and blow up bridges and all kinds of stuff, to construction and roads and, and everything else. And dynamite is just being used. To everybody. It's also being used in war as well. And when his brother dies in 1888, a French newspaper mistakenly publishes an obituary for Alfred instead of his brother. And in that obituary... He calls him, condemns him for his inventions, and refers to him as the merchant of death and the one that brought death to the world. And when Alfred read that, it shocked him to his core that he would leave being called the merchant of death to this world. And so determined to not be remembered for the merchant of death, he takes his fortune, he develops the Nobel Peace Prize so that would honor the person that is pushing forward peace in the nations, peace in the, uh, in the unions, and, and, and so that he would not be remembered uh, as the merchant of death. He examined his life, and what do I want to be remembered for? and he redirected his life. The parable of the mustard seed says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, that you can tell this mountain to be moved and he would move it. Question, how many sticks of dynamite would it take to move Mount Charleston? To blow up the whole mountain and to disassemble that mountain. I believe that we completely miss the point of the parable of the seed, of the mustard seed. Traditional view is that if you just have a little tiny bit of faith, faith is so powerful, right? I mean, how powerful is faith if just the faith of a mustard seed is enough to blow up Mount Charleston? But you see, I believe that's a wrong interpretation. I believe that what we're doing is we're making it about ourselves instead of about God. I don't think this is talking about us at all. I think this is talking about God. This is talking about how powerful God is, not, not how powerful we are with our faith. You see, there is the supernatural and there is the natural, and there's a barrier between the supernatural and the natural. There's the presence of God in the domain that we live in. We're the carnal, natural man living here in this physical existence. And what is it that we have access to God through? Faith. Faith is how we access God. Faith is the conduit through which every single blessing in our life comes. Every single one. And so what it's saying is this. 
that the power of God, right? We've just seen Jesus' demonstration of power and authority here over the wind and the waves. That's nothing compared to the power. How powerful is God? Just stop and ponder that for a minute. How can Jesus teach us how powerful God is? So a mustard seed represents, track with me here, a pinprick. If you're able to just pinprick into the presence of God, the power of God that comes through just a pinprick of faith can move mountains. So how powerful of God that it just requires just the tiniest bit of connection to God in order for God's power to come through enough power to be able to even move mountains in your life. And I believe this is teaching us all about the power of God. And are you trusting in that power of God and pressing into the power of God? Now, when it looks, when it's talking about faith, I just want you to know something. Jesus is the author of faith. Jesus is the provider of faith. And Jesus is the object of faith. So he is the author, he's the provider, and he's the object. Author, provider, so he's the author of faith. He's the one that authors it. But now he also gives it to you, he provides it to you. And guess what? He's the object of faith. And his power is so immense that if you will apprehend him by faith, even just the size of a mustard seed, that's going to be absolutely Sufficient and adequate. Last point I want to make, and we'll close in prayer. Jesus asked them, why were they afraid? Why, why are they afraid? They're in the presence of Jesus. We know that Jesus said, go to the other side. You know, they, they should have known that nothing can happen when you're in the presence of Jesus, right? We know that. That's what we commonly look at that. But here's the question that I've got. They were in the physical presence of Jesus, but they were still afraid because they weren't in his presence by faith. See, you can come to church, and you're physically here, but are you connected to Jesus by faith? They could walk around with Jesus, be in his presence, but you know what? Jesus says, where's your faith? See, it's not enough that you're just in, in my presence. Are you connected to me? See, in the physical realm, they were in his physical presence. But the kingdom of God is the spiritual realm. And in order for you to be connected, you've got to be connected in the spiritual realm by faith. And so we can go through the motions. We can be around God's people. We can do all of these things and never press in by faith into the presence of Jesus. And it gets all the way back to those conditions of the heart again. <laughs> and being physically or spiritually in his presence. May God just do a mighty work in our life. I, wanna, I, I just want to pray that you would get excited about God changing your life. About transformational living where the power of God is really released in your life to start changing you. It's not about you changing yourself. It's about you coming into the presence of Jesus. And in his presence... Everything has changed. And so these are what these parables are teaching us right now. We don't want to go through the motions and just be physically. We want to press in. And so how do we do that? We ask, Lord, help me to come into your presence. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. And so we just ask that you would continue to do this amazing work in our life. God, we want to see you move. We want to see you move. And I want to see you move. I want to see you move in my life. I want to see you move in my family's life. I want to see you move in my children's lives. I want to see you move in the church. Lord, I want to see your power. I want to see changed life, transformed living. Not just a bunch of saved people waiting to get into heaven, but people that are excited about being drawn into the deeper water of your presence. So, Father God, salt our tongues, make us hungry, make us discontent, Lord, uh, so that we will press deeper, a divine discontent that seeks more of you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.